Uh, good evening uh, on this uh, hot and sultry uh, Saturday. I um, hope you're all not uh, getting too much of a bead on uh, and getting too too hot and sweaty. Uh, unusually for uh, for us, it's been uh, very very warm, uh, which means a lot of watering recently. So fingers crossed, all of our uh, trees haven't suffered too much over the last couple of days. Uh, and especially accent plants, because that's what we're going to talk about uh, this evening. Um, and um, it's going to be kind of like a bit of a two-part uh, live stream tonight. Uh, first bit will be me uh, just sort of talking on um, kind of about the, the ideas behind accent plants, Kusa Mono, just some of the differences. It's really not that kind of a complex a subject um, from the, like the definition perspective and things like that. Um, the, the difficulty sort of comes in the kind of the application of it and the actual kind of like creation of it and, and, and such like and that is one thing that I will say right from the beginning is that I'm very bad at this okay so uh, accent plants uh, kusamono are one of those things that you have to be very kind of like green fingered green thumb just, just horticulturally kind of like skilled um, at doing because their sort of requirements are slightly different from, from, from bonsai they need like, different soils they need different amounts of water different sunlight requirements and all these different things uh, and so trying to bounce all of those things up can be very very difficult uh, and particularly if you uh, travel around a lot as I have done previously it's very very difficult to, to grow I mean I know that Ryan Neal in his streams when he's done anything about accent plants he's always said that you know like they're the hardest thing in bonsai to, to keep alive and, things like that. and I totally understand that so total kudos to anybody who, who manages to to, um, uh, to to do it very very well uh, and so in the second part of the um, the uh, the uh, the stream was going to be an interview with um, Tom Buchanan, uh, who is a, a UK enthusiast who has uh, a lot of very interesting um, uh, accent plants. Uh, and one of the things that, like, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to Tom is because uh, through his um, sort of sharing of images and, and his knowledge on the Discord community, um, which is available to people who donate to the live streams, uh, he showed a lot of the kind of the use of native. Um, accent plants and things like that, which is something I was very, very interested in. Uh, one of the things about kind of like using accent plants that I don't particularly uh, kind of I, I don't sort of like so much is the use of kind of just like weird and wonderful showy type of, of flowers and things. My tastes, where it comes to accents and kusamono and all that kind of thing, uh, does very much sort of tend towards the um, weeds tend towards some of the, the less kind of um, uh, weird and wonderful cultivars um, and a lot more of the kind of the native type uh, of plants and things like that. And so we're going to look at that uh, a little bit. Uh, if anybody has any questions, then please put them in the, in the chat. I'll answer them as best as I can. Uh, however, basically, we'll just go through like a, some, some slides and some pictures and, and things like that and talk about kind of like the, the use of accent plants and how they actually get used in, in exhibitions and things like that and some of the kind of the important concepts and then we'll move into, into that video. So, um, I hope everyone can hear me uh, and everything is going okay. Uh, nobody's mentioned it on the chat, so I think we're all good. So we'll move into, into some of these pictures and slides and stuff. Okay. Uh, right, so um, using accent plants, as I said, is uh, it's very kind of a tricky area of, of, of bonsai display and uh, it can really make or break a, a good tree. And so one of the things you see particularly in Japan um, with the kokofu is some really, really great trees displayed at the kokofu town. Uh, but the accent plants that are put with them are really quite poor. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this in the, in the interview, so I won't get into to do much detail. And equally, like a lot of European exhibitions and things like that, there are lots of very kind of really, really great trees that have uh, just poorly thought out um, accent plants um, or companion plants, whichever word you want to use um, for them, uh, you know, when they're put on display. And so, you know, so this is where we're going to sort of like focus on this a little bit. Uh, and really the idea is to accentuate the main object. So the tree or suiseki, if that's what you're displaying, really is the main object. And so all of the aspects of the plant uh, and lots of different aspects, size, direction, uh, seasonality, location, all these things must relate to the tree and uh, kind of accentuate it, you know, bring it uh, to a higher level rather than sort of dominate or you know not take part in it, which is often, often the case. Uh, and so things, 
like harmony and consistency are very very important uh, ideas in, uh, in that and so before we kind of like just sort of delve into it uh, just look at some of the idea, the, sort of the definitions of the terms and things like that. So the accent plant, companion plants. So a lot of people in America maybe call them companion plants. People over here call them accent plants. Uh, basically, like the Japanese word is shitaksa. Uh You may have heard other pronunciations of this, um, including some very funny ones. Um, but yeah, it's shitaksa. And the first character uh, here means under, and this means plant. Okay. Uh, and these are the types of the accent plants, the plants that get put alongside a bonsai when they're being put on display. The, uh, the other definition is of, of, is of a kusamono. Okay, so these are the your accent plants or shtaksa. So these are the kind of things that are there to accentuate a, tr a bonsai on display. The kusamono, uh, the character there, the same character for plant, uh, and the, the other character means thing, is something that's displayed that's basically uh, enjoyed for its own beauty and designed to be the main object. Okay, so it's not trying to, it's not acting as a support to, to a tree. That is the main thing that you're looking at and enjoying. Okay, so here's some examples of Kusamono. Uh, as I said, they're displayed by themselves. This is one that was uh, displayed at uh, Mr. Kobayashi's garden, uh, Shunkaien. There it is, a uh, mixed planting of various different things. Don't ask me to, 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 to name all these different species and things. Again, that's one area that I'm very, very weak on. Okay. Uh, and here's some other pictures um, from the internet. Uh, these are, would be described as Kusamono. And one of the things that you definitely notice about Kusamono is the importance of this, of the, the kind of relationship with the ceramic container. Uh, and there's some very kind of like um, interesting types of containers that get used, things that wouldn't necessarily be uh, paired with bonsai. Uh, and a lot of the, the design concepts that you see here and ideas are very much kind of influenced um, by a lot of uh, ikebana. Okay. So this type of uh, ceramic container would be very, very difficult to use uh, with, with bonsai, but for, for a kusamono type of display that would just be viewed on its own, that combination, the appreciation of the ceramic vessel and the plant themselves is where it's very, very important. Uh, now, all of those pictures uh, were from uh, the website of uh, Young Cho, who is uh, an American um, bonsai, uh, a sort of kusamono artist. Um, and she studied in Japan with a very famous um, sort of a kusamono type master. This is her website, uh, kusamonochoe.com. Uh, she's featured on the, the Mirai live streams and things like that. And she's very, very talented. And like most of her stuff, that you, or all of her stuff that you see here, you know, is just of the, the, the kind of the real highest order. Uh, and, you know, of, of, of any kind of like equal that you would sort of see in Japan. And she really does kind of get the, the, the understanding of the kind of, the, the how to put the plants together. Because one of the important things with the Kusamono types of displays is that putting the multiple plants together is to have them growing together sort of um, without competing against each other uh, over long periods of time. So definitely go and check her out. Uh, just a few other people that you would want to have a look at uh, in terms of their kind of their kusamono and also accent plant creations, but mainly the kusamono stuff. Uh, a lot of these people you may know, but just give a shout out to them. Michael Hagedorn, uh, these are some of his pictures, some of his uh, creations, uh, you know, these multiple um, species uh, plantings, ferns, native plants growing in, in the, the woods around him um, and I'll get on to talk a little bit about these later uh, but the, there's some of Michael's creations okay there's a little accent type plant that would be used there uh, and some other people you might not know uh, Al Rotmar who is uh, based on the kind of like the Swiss uh, on the Austrian um, uh, Italian border up there. He's um, his Instagram. If you if you don't follow it, definitely go on and look at his stuff there. Uh, he's he's got a really good uh, aesthetic eye, um, and this, the understanding of kind of like long term cultivation. So you see the same accents kind of like coming through and through, um, and the the kind of the, the character that they that they they build over the years um, uh, is something of you know that, that's, that's kind of like very very important to this kind of aesthetic ideas within the the. The realm of, of accent plants and, and kusamono and such like. Uh, the other person that I really enjoy looking at, uh, Mario Comster's work uh, at Bonsai Motor World. I'm sure you all know who Mario is. If you don't, go out and find his, his stuff on, on Instagram and other social media and stuff like that. And he's definitely got this kind of same uh, appreciation for the delicate 
and elegant plantings uh, that you can see here and um, his pairing with the ceramics and things is is, is 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 very very good and again this idea of like the mochikomi this over over years and years and years okay so there are three people that four people uh, including young that you should definitely kind of go out and have a look at uh, and as I said, like the a lot of this information is already out there, so I'm not going to go, go into it too much um, because it's, as I said, it's really quite a simple um, thing to, to to do, but it's very difficult to to, um, to actually put into practice and execute very very well. Um, but the, you can't really talk about the, the the concepts behind it much more than you know for, for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, that, that sort of thing. Um, but when we come on to, to, to looking at the, the display aspect and actually sort of using them uh, in, a, in a display, which is um, what we're kind of uh, going to look at, uh, there are lots of sort of considerations that need to be um, taken into consideration. <laughs> lots of things that need to be taken into consideration when you're doing it. Uh, and basically, it's just the same sort of ideas as you know any sort of design uh, concepts and ideas. So thinking about the, the size, the height, the visual mass of things, colours and textures, uh, the direction as you can see here I've repeated itself is very very important, the directions of, of accent plants, you often see you know the accent plants pointing off in the complete opposite direction to uh, to, to the tree uh, or you know the positioning within the, the display space being um, too close or too far away from, from things okay that all of those considerations then go down to the pot and the stand uh, and then also the age the, and this idea of mochi come so if you've got some tree that is you know 500 600 years old and you're trying to kind of like show this mature looking image are you wanting to 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 balance that i mean it's, there's no right or wrong when it, when it sort of comes to display but are you looking to to sort of complement that with a with an accent plant which is which shows that same signs of maturity or are you looking to maybe create a contrast and have something which is bright and vibrant okay so it all depends on your your kind of um, aesthetic ideas that you're looking to to try and um, sort of put forward uh, for some of them uh, but but definitely for some with the, the the size and the position and direction and things like that these are these are sort of fundamental kind of um, design and aesthetic concepts that need to be sort of uh, put into place uh, and so looking at some of these pictures and some of these pictures are exhibits that have been put on either this is from the BSA show um, way back when um, and there's some pictures from, from other exhibitions and if your display comes up I'm going to be and I'm sort of criticising it then I'm, I'm sorry if, if you take it personally but you know I'm just here to these are just some pictures that I had on my uh, hard drive and, and, and cameras and stuff to use as kind of like examples of what I think my personal opinion um, to be good bad could be improved upon uh, and so, like looking at this, uh, this this display here, I mean, realistically, the size, one of the size concepts, is, is it should be one of the easiest things to to kind of um, to, to really gauge and to balance. Um, you know, when we have, when we're looking at something which is going to accentuate the main object, we don't want it to be the same size as it. We don't want it to be similar, you know, of a similar order of magnitude. Uh, and so we're looking at something which is going to be complementary in terms of the size. Okay, so. The relationship between these two here, this larch, uh, and this, I think it's a uh, Cotoniaster or something like that, uh, the size there is, is pretty good. But other than that, there's very little that you would say works, works brilliantly um, as, a, as, a, as an accent plan, as a companion between the two in terms of things like sort of seasonality, repetition of the, the imagery, um, the, the kind of the formality of the, of the pot and the stand combination there. You know, there's no kind of seasonal aspect to it. There's a, there's a lot of kind of missed opportunities for adding extra layers of depth and enjoyment to it as a display. Uh, but from a size perspective, it's it's been very, very well achieved. Okay, here's something at the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, this was from the um, Salier last year. Uh, this is a sort of a chew hinish size white pine. So that's maybe about 50 centimetres tall, uh, 60 centimetres at most. Uh, and then this massive accent plant, which has more green on it than the main tree does. Okay, so they're just the, the the size of this accent plant here just dominates this space uh, and really kind of like overpowers this 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 tree. Okay, so that not as successful. 
Uh, and it not, might not necessarily just be the, the the size of the actual kind of like the object itself, but kind of like the area of influence that the accents can sort of take up. And when we look at the the kind of the the visual weight of objects, we would take into account things such as like you know the the direction and the lines of objects and things such as this. Uh, and looking at this display, when I saw it in in in, in real life, I, I definitely sort of felt that the uh, this 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 line of the the ivy sort of growing up uh, and above the the line of the the, the lower line of this um, uh, of the, the, sort of the cascading branch of the tree uh, was kind of like overpowering it and and sort of con conflicting uh, between the two objects rather than accentuating it. Uh, and if we look at that without with it removed, uh, we get a much sort of better sort of sense of balance. And so although the actual object is very small, it's kind of area of influence and all of the space that gets created within these two lines just dominates this entire space in, in and around here. Whereas without it, that space becomes open and can belong to the tree rather than belonging to the accent as it does there. Okay, so when we when we're looking at things such as size, it's kind of not necessarily the, the, the physical size, but the kind of like the visual weight, the, the space that it takes up, and, and the the attract the, the how much it attracts the the viewer's eye that that, that can be very important. In addition to, to to those, you know, the the, the size concepts and, and things like that, colors and textures are, are, are one thing where um, accent plants definitely need to be used for their uh, you know, for the, at their most, um, particularly with with a, an evergreen tree, uh, some of those examples you've seen there. Obviously, the, the the autumnal images. I can understand why the the person displaying this has wanted to use the ivy with the uh, the, the red leaves coming on there. Uh, and if you look closely, there's red berries and some, some dropping autumnal foliage. Okay, uh, and in this example here, this was a, a showing uh, accent plant that was used uh, for a display at the same exhibition. There's been lots of, um, um, we've got this kind of like just turning of the season from, from late summer into, into early autumn type feel um, with the berries and the, and the red leaves. Uh, and so it's a really good way of adding a, a splash of colour, a splash of seasonality to, to, to a display. That's where its main kind of... Um, purpose uh, you know of accent plants really sort of comes in okay uh the other thing that i mentioned uh and is very important so i'm gonna sort of focus on that a little bit with these ones here uh is the sort of the concept of, of, of direction uh and when we're looking at um uh sort of accent plants kind of positioning within uh relative to, to trees and things like that uh when we kind of got this this one and two tree, uh, this one tree and an accent type uh, of, of situation. Uh, it kind of acts as a, a full stop. So it kind of we have the the flow of a tree moving down, uh, and the accent plant is there to kind of like hold within to balance that movement to to keep the eye of the viewer within this in, within this space. Uh, in the case of a, a a three tree display or showing type displays, you know the accent plant. Sort of doesn't act as a full stop. It kind of acts as a comma, guiding you around uh, in, in the, the, the way in which you want to kind of um, the, the, the viewer's eye to, to 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 look at the display. Okay, so if we just have a focus on this, uh, this was a uh, this is a show in Larch, uh, which was displayed at a BSA show uh, many moons ago, and the the dis the, the this um, accent that's been used here. Uh, is very very kind of skillfully uh, positioned and used in order to really balance the the flow and the visual weight of this tree here uh, and this is a really interesting one to look at because there's there's a lot of kind of conflicting um, uh, movements and visual weights uh, within this uh, this action itself so if we look at the kind of the, the the flow of the tree within this display obviously the tree is moving from left to right okay so we have this branch it's a it's an informal upright tree uh, this negative, the this negative space here, the longer branch across on this side, the movement from the root, that first movement in the trunk, uh, going up towards the right-hand side into that branch, makes the tree go from left to right. Okay, so we want this to just sort of flow down. Okay, and rather than that, the, the the eye just escaping out into into the next display. Okay, we're just ignoring the fact that there's a scroll up there for the moment. Um, 
we want this the you know the, this to, to sort of stop and almost kind of just stay within this space okay so this accent plant here does a very good job of, of holding that so when we look at this we look at the kind of the the, the positioning of it on the jeta so the jeta being the the, the, the piece of wood uh, it's ever so slightly off center so we have a little bit more of extra space on this side than we do on this side and then here's where it becomes, starts to become quite interesting within this uh, within this accent plant because we have a couple of different sort of conflicting movements. We have the the movement of the the accent pot itself. Okay, so normally you would say uh, uh, the, you know this pot is moving from left to right. Okay, so looking back at our tree, that's actually going in the same direction as the tree. So you might think that that's perhaps not quite as um, uh, effective at sort of stopping it, it's sort of taking on the same direction. But what we do have is this one long thin stem of the fern, which is growing up here and creating this space in, in here. So if we look at these two sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the lines of, the visual lines that, that, that are going on there, what's happening, uh, we've got that strong line of the pot and of the tree sort of coming down here. But this just simply by having that one strand of the of the fern growing up in there creates this, this space here, which is larger than the space on this side. Okay, and that can that sort of that the line going up here and following up that uh, the, the line of this the, the, the fern helps to really kind of create that stopping power. To, to, to take the, the, the eye, to take the kind of the, the flow of the direction, you know, the, the, the visual flow down there and sort of stop. If this had been positioned across the other side, I should have gone to my, you know, my magic photoshopping skills, but if this, uh, this accent plant had been positioned on the other side of the Jita, then we wouldn't have that same space that we have in here. If the, uh, the fern would have been pointing across in the other, another direction, or if the, the pot had been going in different directions, then balances would have changed, uh, would not have been quite as, uh, get the same effect. Okay. Now, it does seem like very, very sort of minor points, but this is where, as I said right at the start, you can really make or break a, a, re, a, a bonsai display. And it's not just simply a case of putting down any old accent and making it, just having something there. Really, sort of paying attention to um, you know the, the the spaces within uh, within the displays, within the accent plants themselves, uh, and really giving a good 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 consideration to all of these points makes the difference between what's a good display uh, and what's a, an excellent display, and what's had artistic thought and consideration sort of put into it. Okay, so looking at this, this is a another um, uh, exhibit from the. Uh, Salia, uh, and wonderful kind of root of a rock trident maple. It's not really sort of showing any autumnal colour, so we're going to go with the, that late sort of late summer sort of feel to it. Lovely luscious green moss, uh, and this accent plant here, which is very nicely sized. Uh, and in terms of the the positioning within, we'll we actually get on to, to talk about that in a minute. Uh, you know, obviously that's sort of determined by the sort of the space that's been given to you, and so you have to do, make the best that you can, that you can do. Um, the positioning, the size of it, it all looks really quite nice but if you just look at the positioning of this accent plant with its you know the, the, the space there if we actually just flip it around just acts as that just having that extra little bit of space in there just opens it up a little bit more this accent plant then flows down into this space oh dear gone too far flows down into the space the lines sort of meet up a little bit more than the continuation of the line going all the way down through there and so even just something as small as that that's my magical photoshop skills there you can see there there's just a little bit of uh, I, I, paint that I missed okay it took me about half an hour to, to learn how to flip that around so skills uh, but yeah just just sort of looking at sort of small things like that and then the positioning of that within the with on, on top of the uh, the Jita maybe having a little bit of extra space on this side rather than on this side we we'll just add those extra little pieces of, um, sort of uh, visual way or you know the ability to, to, to balance things up uh, and, and get those flows working complementary to each other okay so 
positioning obviously is one thing um, that is very similar to, to the direction and things like that. And so, as I said, uh, with a lot of the displays, you're really limited to, um, to, to the space that's given to you at, uh, in, in exhibitions. Uh, and so we look, when sort of judging or critiquing uh, a, an exhibition, you obviously have to, to be quite sort of sympathetic to that and understanding of it. Um, but quite often you will see things really badly done. Okay, but uh, if we look at this, uh, this was a display by John Armitage at the same uh, BSA show, uh, and uh, the difference between putting those two, just a small movement uh, to separate, the, you know, the, of the accent plant there, really sort of changes the the um, the positioning of or, or the, the 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 work that this accent plant does. Um, when the accent plant was positioned here, as John did it, uh, and I would say this sort of more correctly, it acts to um, to work with the the second, you know, the tree that's out by itself. Okay, so these two, you can sort of see those as um, a, a set within themselves, which help to balance up the four trees across here. Sorry, whereas move that accent plant across there, we're lining up with our with our stand it starts to move away from that which which group does it join in with uh, and so this these ideas sort of re really sort of come into play uh, particularly with with the show him but we, with all sorts of displays okay this is a, a show him display that was put on at the same Salio exhibitions and this was um, uh, by Mark and Ritter Cooper uh, who are watching so I best uh, say nice things about it but this was a, a very good um, uh, a very well thought out because I actually you know, sort of uh, Ritter, who is a very good um, uh, and one of the most talented British uh, sort of Kusumono um, accent plant uh, creators, uh, spent a lot of time uh, working on this, um, and we made just a few tiny little tweaks on it uh, at the ex exhibit in order to really kind of make it work as it should do, uh, which is a really kind of like a, as a connecting point between the two. Unit. So we talked about in in the last one, this one being, uh, you know, the accent kind of belonging to uh, the the outer tree is in in a sense, but it also takes the eye up into connecting to to both of those two to sort of displays, and so really looking at the positioning of that one, uh, you know, if we if we sort of drew a plumb line, it, you know, between the spacing between the main uh, stand uh, and this accent. It would be somewhere kind of just about here, so we're ever so slightly on the on the the juniper side of that line. Okay, but when we're looking at the kind of the the lines within this accent plant in in itself. Okay, so looking at that carefully, this this carefully positioned grass points up to the up to the juniper. So our eye works its way down. Do, 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 do. Comes into this bounce, uses a trampoline board. Then up into the juniper equally. We look at this, guided back down and across. Okay, so there's just this very, very sort of careful consideration of the positioning and the the contents of of that accent plant really do make or break uh, a, um, uh, a a display in in and of itself. Okay, so comparing that to this is one from the Gafu Ten. You know, this accent plant here doesn't really have that same kind of effect. Uh, this, I'm not sure if this was from the gap. This was something. Uh, this was from uh, Saitama, the the World Convention. Uh, so different time of year, but th this one here doesn't really kind of like have that sort of same effect and that same level of interest in terms of the textures and the colours. So this one just seems a little bit on the plain side, whereas this one gives all of those sort of extra layers of of um, added interest and seasonality. Obviously, we've got a bit of seasonality here. But the size uh, and the, the sort of the directionality of this of this accent plant doesn't um, doesn't work as as well. Okay, so one of the ways to sort of think about it, and this is kind of like how I go about it, is really when we're looking at that. And when I talked talked about sort of dropping a plumb line down uh, in in terms of uh, you know between here. Uh, one of the ways to, to sort of really consider the positioning of, of where we put the accent plants and things like that uh, is to consider the, the kind of the idea of moments. Um, and, um, you know, having a, a, a seesaw. Okay, so here we have the, the heavier weight, which is closer to the pivot. 
which is balanced by a weight which is half its weight, but twice as far away. Okay, this is GCSE physics. Okay, give me a lever and I can I can move the world. This is why we use levers to, to kind of like multiply force. Okay, uh, and when we're looking at kind of like our displays and things like that and the positioning of our accent plants, we can have a quite a small accent plant, but positioned slightly further away. So we have that extra space. So thinking back to the one with our with our eyes going, uh, our the arm kind of going across it because it destroyed that space. Its effect was was changed. Having uh, you know a, a smaller accent plant further away, larger accent plant maybe sort of close. You know all of these ideas kind of sort of come into place. Obviously it's not scientific. Don't get your tape measures out and start weighing things up because it's more visual weight rather than kind of like actual weight. But that, you know, it's that type of idea that you need to sort of look at. And there's some examples coming up where we can sort of talk about this sort of thing. Right. So the other thing that uh, is is very really kind of like important with um, with the accent plants, and this is a picture of that one, which was a beautiful accent plant, really, really great. Um, I loved it. Beautiful container, really well made. Just the space on the wrong side. But anyway, uh, obviously not having seen the accent plant from the other side, that side of the pot may be broken there might be all sorts of reasons why it was displayed that way so just using that as a, a as an example but uh, in terms of the sorts of the suitability of, of, of accent plants and things like that the the, the time of year is, is something uh, really kind of important so we mentioned that about giving the indications of seasons that's especially true with conifers okay so obviously with deciduous trees other fruiting and flowering trees there's, there's obviously seasonal aspects that can can be shown in the tree itself but with, with the evergreens we don't tend to sort of see that thing so and then one of the kind of the concepts that has been put forward uh, and is, is, is very true it should be kind of like adhered to wherever possible is this kind of idea of the origin of the tree it's there to, to kind of to tell the story of where the tree came from to give you some context to try and conjure up to paint the picture of you being up there in that space be it lowland be it marshland be it high mountainous okay and so when we've got these kind of conflicting um, areas within the same sort of space to anybody who has an interest in, in nature or to anybody who's you know who, who goes out walking in these in these places and who can easily kind of imagine it starts to tell all sorts of strange stories and so it doesn't work as an artistic kind of, sort of creation okay with the larger trees this is very very important and for a lot of people our kind of like our main uh, sort of area that we might sort of see um, plants uh, you know weeds uh, might be in car parks such as this one uh, this is a, an axa plant that um, uh, is growing in Sainsbury's car park um, I'm not sure of the, of the variety uh, but as you can see, it is it comes with its own uh, fag butts uh, and various different um, uh, pieces of rubbish. And although this is a is a, you know, perhaps a little bit of a joke, you know, plants such as this taken out of that context and then put into a into a pot and grown on, maybe grown with with a few other things, can tell the story of an urban landscape. Okay, and so if we were looking at creating a, an urban type of, of um, uh, display, then that sort of thing would be would be something to think about. Talk about context, uh, and so trying to match things up contextually is very very important. So here we've got this really kind of like um, high mountainous type of image, lots of luscious flowers. You know, the primrose you might find that in a in a, in a sort of similar type of environment, but you know this lusciousness. Um, and the, the the wildness of it, are they matching up? Okay, these are these are things you have to sort of look at. If we wanted to use rather than this kind of big gorgeousness of, uh, of flowers and, and things like that, we want to add a splash of colour and the the kind of the seasonality, the the, the more sort of location. Then using something like this, which is a little uh, piece of heather displayed beautifully with uh, a Scots pine. So you know, Scots pine grow. Heather surrounds it. It's, you know, it's a simple idea. Okay, this was very, very beautifully um, uh, put together. A simple display up at, up at the the BSA show back in, back in the day. Uh, and again, looking at things such as the direction of this um, of this uh, heather. Uh, very important, sort of pointing towards that space that's created by the positioning on the slate. 
this is something which really you know works very well even though it, it was put on an, ang uh, an angle due to the, the space that it was displayed in. Coming back to uh, something which uh, you know if we're looking at say the, the size uh, concept uh, and the distance from the tree this is something which is really quite sort of successful we've got quite a heavy weight with the tree quite a powerful um, uh, stand and pot so there's, there's quite a lot of visual weight so we've got a decent sized um, uh, accent plant here and positioned in such a way that it, it balances it out quite nicely from a, from a visual weight type of perspective however from a, from a suitability perspective in terms of the the shininess the porcelain kind of nature of the pot the green lusciousness of the, 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 of the foliage and, and the and the moss compared to this kind of like high mountains severe you know severe image type that we've got here the two are perhaps not trying to sort of tell the same story so this works on some levels but not on all okay and trying to marry to, to marry up all of those different elements within a, an accent plant is, is really sort of quite difficult okay but if this had been planted same accent plant planted in a bit more of a rustic type container uh, where our eye isn't going to go towards the shiny nature of it as opposed to the kind of like the matte almost like unglazed type look here a little bit, something a little bit more somber then we would kind of want to go for you know that, that might work a little bit more more sort of successfully uh, perhaps not quite so luscious and green okay and that sort of concept of sort of suitability runs from from lots of different uh, perspectives and ideas and concepts and things like this so we've got this very kind of um, informal uh, tree that's uh, an azalea I think um, and it's planted in a very kind of um, mod oh dear, sorry, modern uh, Tom Bender pot with the uh, you know it's a slightly informal type looking pot uh, uh, on top of this uh, I assume it's a found object type of um, a stand okay in and of itself this this looks really really great you know full marks really good i love the spacing underneath the uh you know in underneath the feet kind of gives it a nice light airiness it's all lovely and everything but then it's matched with this very formal stand uh and this accent plant which i mean what's that doing to, to add to this as a as a, as a as a piece it's not really just not doing that much Okay, so from a size perspective, maybe it's a little bit too light. Uh, from a uh, from a formality perspective, you know, our, anything that's acting as a as an accent should be less formal than the the main object. Okay, obviously we're looking to try and make the the main object the the the, uh, the point of focus where we're trying to sort of show our respect. So having sort of more formal pieces used. Uh, with our accents is something that doesn't tend to, to, to work very well. Okay, if this was a much more formal tree, then having formal stands and things like that, not a problem. But the informality of this and the formality of uh, the accent, particularly the stand, doesn't that seem to work. Uh, then we look at things such as the you know the sort of seasonality aspect of it, and that can take go through to um, uh, the, the the use of bamboo stands as well. Uh, and so, you know, it's not just the, 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 the plant itself, okay, this from a size perspective isn't too bad, okay, there's not great amount of sort of seasonality in it, we can't sort of necessarily see the pot quite so, so well, uh, but this sort of very formal uh, sort of square uh, bamboo stand is something that we would tend to sort of see with summer displays and such like. Uh, and again, Sort of going back to that idea of formality this is just another example of that a very sort of formal looking um, uh, stand and it's lovely literati high mountain type image plant and then uh, a tree and then what that you know what what how is that sort of telling the, the sort of the, the sort of similar sort of story of uh of the of the tree okay here are some examples of ones which are much more sort of subtle and in keeping with the, the the character of the tree so this is a tree which is showing great kind of like uh subtle mochikomi type of age that age that develops over a long time uh, in a pot we can see that in the lichen 
uh, on the on the on the surface on the trunk. We can see that in the way in which it's been deliberately kind of like unwired uh, and just sort of rough around the edges. Uh, and so this very sort of vague, indistinct uh, moss planting uh, has been used. Uh, and from a side perspective, it works very very well. Uh, and, the, in, and the sort of the distance, obviously, displaying in a tokamone anywhere where you have um, sort of space uh, considerations, uh, you know that that's the backdrop. The frame is something that that has to be sort of taken in, into consideration. Okay, and so making sure it's not in this case, if this had been placed too 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 close to the um, to, to the shelf there, then things start to to interfere. But again, with that idea of just kind of like dropping a plumb line right down the middle of, of the space, you know, we balance out nicely between those two, but we still have movement. We still have you know different uh, lines of movement um, within the within the display as a whole. Uh, but this accent plant there is just something which is just nondescript and calm and mature feeling. Doesn't the eye doesn't go to it? It just it's just filling some space. It's just balancing things out. Okay, so that works very, very sort of well. We're looking at that idea of kind of um, of, of maturity and age, and kind of uh, the mochikomi uh, word, which comes up from you know, Japanese uh, aesthetics and things like that. The, the it's idea of kind of like not repotting, not refreshing, trying to build a sense of maturity into the plants, um, and not just constantly refreshing them all the time. Uh, these are three uh, accent plants from uh, Michael Hagedorn's uh, blog. You know, these are three that he was um, doing some work on at the end of the, the summer, so um, end of the, the, the uh, of autumn. So everything's basically kind of all these grasses have grown and ferns have grown and, and, and spent. They're starting to die off, uh, and so all that gets done, they just get cut, protected over the winter, and then they start growing again. And then through doing that year after year after year, what you thought will tend to start to see is a change in the characteristics of the plants not all plants but a lot of them you'll start to see reduction in the leaf size you'll start to see reduction in node length uh, and just a sort of a sense of maturity and age that you get with them so these are the plants uh, after having been cut and you can see they've been growing there for year after year after year not been repotted the roots in there they die they just regrow into the same space uh, and you, you start to get a, a real sort of sense of character and uh, that's that finished uh, and so that's one of the areas where, we, you know, with the with the accent plants that I really kind of like, what that I particularly like is that that sort of sense of maturity and, and the age. And we've got a, a sort of example of that. Uh, this is something. This is just some blood grass and a fern that was put together this year, uh, and these have all just grown up in in one year. Can't we sort of really see that very well? Okay, and it'll take sort of four, five years, six years before this really starts to sort of take on the kind of character. Where you would be actually sort of looking to to sort of display it, where it's sort of becoming really quite dense. We're getting a little bit more sort of compact growth, uh, and the, the plant itself is starting to slow down and slow down. And it takes on a different characteristic, which takes I won't say a trained eye, but it takes you know you have to be sort of perceptive to it. And this is where the difference between just simply having you know some grass in a pot in a plant pot and something which has been growing uh, you know, as a as a kusamono bonsai this is a hakone grass um, and you can see that even this has been you know in the pot for five six years you know it's still got plenty of soil in there it's still not uh, sort of filled it entirely but if this was planted in the ground the leaves would be so much higher you know it would be a much big bigger bush here it would be something similar to, to this sort of size but it's like bringing the things down and sort of compacting and bringing it into a sense of maturity and a sense of age that is going to be um, complementary to uh, the the tree that's being sort of displayed is the, is the kind of the aesthetic idea that I sort of subscribe to, particularly with the the, the you know the the Japanese displays aesthetics and the way in which bonsai gets displayed, uh, particularly in the West. Right, so. That's kind of uh, just a, a brief look at some of those things. I'll look at some of the questions that we have here. Uh, do, 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 do. do you consider, right, so the three questions. Uh, Graham Jenkins, should the color of the backdrops be taken into account with the overall design? If possible, yes, but we don't always know that uh, in advance. Um, 
are accents ever behind the feature tree? Is it ever considered appropriate? So that front to back spacing is um, something that can be played around with, uh, but generally, the further back you put something within a display space, the smaller it becomes. Uh, and so, generally, they're always sort of positioned ever so slightly towards in the foreground, but that's not always the case. There's no hard and fast rules about it. Uh, and do you consider accents uh, necessary for displays? No, it's not. So there are times when you can use them uh, and obviously times when you're not. So if you are going to use it, make sure you use them correctly. Um, uh, and if you're not going to use them, then make sure that the, the space uh, within the display is filled uh, or is used, utilized to its best. And, uh, so some of those Kado display um, uh, pictures that you s would have seen in previous streams you know, some of those didn't use accent plants, and not all of those Kado displays did use them, uh, and so it's not 100% necessary. Okay, uh, but conventions for for most of the trees would suggest that they are. Okay, right. So that's my sort of take on it, my perspective. Uh, if anybody has any further questions, please put them in the chat, and I'll answer them in the chat. Uh, but now what we're going to do is um, we've been going for about 45 minutes. We've got an interview now with uh, Tom Buchanan, who is. Um, uh, a UK uh, based enthusiast uh, and as I said at the start Tom has been sharing some very interesting pictures uh, and some of his accent plants in the discord community um, and as I said a lot of those ideas and the concepts of the, using the native plants are very good uh, you know, he, he sort of used those you know sort of picking out the weeds from his um, uh, from his driveway and, and, and all this kind of stuff uh, and so a lot of the ideas that I'm would be talking about myself. Tom's actually going to sort of talk about them. Uh, so we've got this interview. It goes on for, for about 45, 50 minutes. So it's quite long. Um, so if you don't want to watch it all now, you can watch it all on the on sort of the catch up later. But it is quite interesting and it does show you what you can do with some very simple plants, things that you can find kind of like in and around um, uh, you know your, your nat sort of natural environment and some of the real sort of uh, important sort of kind of concepts with accent plants. So Thank you very much to Tom, uh, and I'm just going to turn the video on and sit down uh, and enjoy a nice beer. So, speak to you, see you years later when it's finished. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for joining us, Tom. Much appreciated. Evening. Evening. Uh, and thanks for being a supporter and, and for, for watching and, and being a valued member of the, the, the Discord community. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about your bonsai career, like how you got into it and, and, and just... Okay, um, I don't know if you'd quite call it a career. Nah, how you got um, into it as a hobby then? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not 100% sure to be mm. honest. I mean, I've always, I've always had an interest in bonsai ever since I became aware of them. I always thought they were kind of something quite interesting, but I was also aware that it was kind of a game for patient people, if you, yeah. see, if you see what when I mean. You're not a patient so, person. Well, I didn't used to be, you know, as one gets older, one slows down and I'm a little bit more patient nowadays. Maybe that's just because the years go past more quickly. That's a distinct possibility. Um, so probably about 20 years ago, um, I was kind of finally in a place where I could start, you know, actually started having some outside space in the garden and started kind of picking up some little trees and, and trying to keep them alive and so on. So I've been doing bonsai for about... 20 years um but my interest in it probably goes back to maybe five ten years before that since i first became aware of it um, and in terms of accent plants um i think i've always had an awareness that accent plants was something that was around bonsai because i remember going on internet sites mm. back in uh, late 90s or whatever and there was mention of of accent plants uh, although i didn't really have a very good grasp of what they were for yeah. but but looking back at old pictures of my bonsai benches there are little plants in pots kind of lying around in various places um, not very good ones um, it's probably about i don't know maybe just in the last eight years or so that i started understanding Kind of a little bit more about what what they should look like mm. in a sense um and you know how they're used in exhibitions and so on so uh, so yeah so, so, so that's did me. you ever exhibit your own trees at, at yes okay well uh, where have you exhibited um probably probably started exhibiting about six seven years ago um when i kind of first joined the club and first had the opportunity to do that, Which club was that? um 
so it meant Sutton, Sutton Bonsai Society. Um, all was welcome for new members. It's a very uh, active <laughs> and, and quite a good club, actually, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, they're yeah. uh, good people. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yes, yeah, so, so except for various places like Heathrow, mm. Bonsai Expo, kind of our um, annual club show every year that we hold at Wisley, that's, that's always a nice one. And I've kind of always put accents on uh, when I've been displaying there and so on. So, uh, various kind of kind of mid-level uk type shows and so do you feel that you know the kind of like the active display was quite an important part of you learning the importance of uh, of accent plants and, and just kind of opening the new new doors in, in that sense I, I i think there are there are a few things going on there i, I think used properly used really well accent plants can enhance a display mm. at an exhibition um, but some of the things that I do the kind of larger plantings that I like to play around with they wouldn't be suitable mm. for use at exhibitions and it, it really started going when I started going to shows that's when I started to understand a little bit more about well this would work and that wouldn't work and so on and this is you know the kind of situation where this kind of planting is appropriate and that kind of planting and so on yeah well yeah, I think so. that's a you know, it isn't until you actually kind of get out there and, and do it and and uh, put it out for other people to see and to yeah. criticise to a certain extent. But is there, I think, the, like particularly yeah. with the, the, the display concepts, and that's something I'm going to talk about later on in the stream. Um, kind of understanding the size um, and also the yeah. direction relationships with within yeah. an accent plant um, and how they relate to the trees. It isn't until you actually kind of put them up in, in, you know, on display that you really kind of. Uh, kind of really grasp the importance of some of those things so yeah and, and size and complexity as well and not being too showy and having something that actually kind of complements the tree rather Absolutely. than taking attention away from it i, I think, think quite often people put like try and put too much in or just you know to make yeah. it too, a little bit too showy so but anyway you've um you one of the things that's uh in the discord community that you've kind of really um you, you put some some pictures of some of your more like the kusamono type, so they're more kind of the accent plants like of them, you know, just the, the displayable of themselves as opposed to like the, the bonsai mm -hmm. accent plants. I mean, some of the things you put up there are just kind of like I was amazed that people are kind of like doing them in the UK. It's not, you know, it's something that I really wish I could do. Um, but uh, we've got some slides and some stuff here. Do you want to just sort of um, just talk us through a few of them and and uh, just explain some of your creations? So. Okay, so that's ironic one to start with really because it's it's not a little plant it's quite a big one and it's actually not in a pot <laughs> it's it's on a rock um so this is um a large kusamono i guess um it's probably the largest one i've got in my garden What's and this sort that? of thing um it's well if we look at the the next one actually there's a coffee mug next to it there so, so that, that shows the size it is so something like that you certainly wouldn't be using that as an accompaniment for a tree um, in a show because it's, it's much too large, it's much too fussy, it's much too ornate. And one of the, I mean, going back to what you're saying about the importance of going to shows and seeing things, if you just see a picture like this online or whatever, there's no sense of scale. Mm. You know, you don't know how big or how small it is. And, and you know, the same is true of bonsai, really. If you're just seeing pictures of bonsai online or in books, you, you don't get a real sense of how big quite often mm. they actually are so there's a similar sort of thing with with accent plantings companion plantings whatever you want to call them here so this one's just a kind of mixed planting of ferns and some blood grass and you know about four or five other different bits and pieces in there with some moss around it as uh, well what's it actually um, planted on what's... that is a large curved piece of sandstone rock that i found locally um, so it's just I mean, later on the slideshow there are some other examples of stuff planted on rocks, but you, I, I think you don't always need to use a pot no. in order no, no. to kind of create a nice kind of display. Um, so we move on to the next one, and this is complete other end of the scale. This one's in a pot, and this one's tiny. No. Um, this is one of the smallest pots I've got. It's the whole thing is probably about an inch tall. So in contrast to the last one, this is something that we, we could use as an accent with a small tree in a show. And, you know, it's almost too small. It would be lost. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, well, so that's the kind of... You know, I mean, one, one of the things with the, uh, like particularly like with the Shohin uh, accents and things like that, and you see with the, the multiple tree um, displays, 
a lot of those accent plants are really difficult to actually kind of like grow and keep alive for, for long periods yeah. of times and so quite often they're made you know just specifically for shows and things like that yeah um so i mean is that one how long have you had that one uh, that one i i i don't have that in that pot anymore <laughs> um but that would i'd probably have maintained it in that pot for no more than a few months yeah because it would kind of and, and this is something i'll talk about as, as we go along but they change very rapidly mm. over time you know plants grow yeah unfortunately. and they're, they're, they're not <laughs> static the appearance changes yeah. um quite radically and you know maintaining something like this is very difficult what you what you might do is um, if you wanted to keep the fern in a pot that small over a long period of time you might bury it in another pot up to the rim so you get some roots going out it doesn't dry yeah. out too much and so on you should be looking at some yellow flowers uh, with tall reeds in the background. Um, and, and these are kind of native British plants. And one of my kind of preferences, I think, is for, for using native mm. plants, particularly with, with native trees. So, so I'm, I'm quite into using things that occur in the same landscapes as mm. the trees. So um, what are these? They, these are a uh, little yellow potentilla and um, some sort of wild rush. I'm not exactly sure and you what species it is. Collected those locally. Some moss in there as well. Um, some of them come from weeds in the garden. Um, I mean, coll collecting is a kind of tricky issue. Mm. You know, sourcing accent plants. I say that I. I like using natives, but that doesn't mean that you should just kind of go out to the local woods with a shovel and yeah. so on. So a lot of what I use is actually stuff that actually grows in my garden, weeds from the driveway and things like that. Um, you can pick seeds and so on, cuttings yeah. and so on. But yeah, I'm, I'm encourage people to go out kind of wholesale to the woods um, and dig stuff up because for one thing it's illegal. <laughs> so, um, but there are, if you are into native plants, there are quite a few companies nowadays that do sell British native plants, mm. seeds and full grown plants. Um, just look on eBay, look on the websites yeah. and so on. So um, you, you can actually source stuff quite easily. About three, four years ago, I, I had, uh, I think I read a, a blog post by Michael Hagedorn and kept, wanted to, I, want, want, I was like, okay, I'm inspired to do some, some native um, uh, accent plants and stuff like that. And I bought up a load of seeds and I sowed them. Uh, and they sort of started to come through, but very 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 badly with them because obviously traveling around a lot um was, yeah they also just tended to die um but yeah some some they are those seeds are out there if you if you do do want to search for them yeah yeah there's a lot of uh, michael haggardorn is in me I, I really love his work he's, he does some some really mm. beautiful compositions so he's well worth looking up on facebook or whatever yeah. um okay Excellent. moving on yeah so this is getting into the territory um, of something being too flashy that you probably wouldn't want to use as an accompaniment mm. for a tree because there's there's a lot going on there. Um, again, the, you know, these plants are actually weeds mm. um, with the exception of the, the fern. Um, there's a heart's tongue fern in there and there's also a seedling of a spindle tree. Um, the, the pink flower is Herb Robert um, and that's a weed that grows all over the place little lilac one in the middle that's ivy leaf toad flax that's something you'll see in a lot of these pictures you've got the little yellow potentilla down at the bottom again there's some ivy in there um so it's it's colorful um but you know too colorful to use in the display i think but if we move on to the next one this is a much smaller one so again we've got the, the same flower in this one the um ivy leaf toad flax with the little lilac flowers and there's some grasses, a baby fern in there. Um, the scale, the pot in this one is about two, three centimeters tall. Mm. Um, and this is one that I, I would use and I have used in various incarnations um, in shows along with trees. Moving on to the next one. Ah, oh, this is one I really like. <laughs> Thanks. So this is the same, same pot again. Yeah. In fact, it's the same planting, but kind of at a different stage in its life. Um, the grasses that were in this one have grown out again. That's um, another type of native rush. I think it's a, a joint leaf rush, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and there's some baby ferns in there as well. Um, and that's, you know, the same pot, the same planting as the previous one, but it's evolved. Mm. And, and you'll see this the same pot again later on, I think. Uh, next one in a blue pot, we've got a, a bugle. 
Um, again, this is a native plant. Again, we've got some other stuff around the base. This one's a bit thin um, in terms of um, any kind of presence because if, if, you, if you think about how you design something like this, it's very much like photography where you've got a background, middle ground and foreground, mm. like a story that should have a beginning, middle and an end. Um, one of the things you read about designing accent plants in Kusumono is that there should be a, a tall thing, there should be something at the top, there should be something in the, the middle, and then there should be something low down um, covering the, the surface of the pot, maybe partially obscuring the pot in many cases if, if it's a really old one. Uh, and this one Kind of looks immature. Um, it's a, it's it's a bit thin, particularly in the middle. And it's a lovely plant, but the the interest is up at the top, and the interest is down at the bottom, and the bit in the middle is a little bit sparse. Mm. Uh, so it might look better if you plonked it into something like the next one, um, which is a mixed planting with lots of stuff going on in it. Um, this one was actually meant to have some bluebells in the middle. Planted the bulbs. Um, it never flowered, um, so we, we've got the uh, we've got the leaves, but no flowers. Do you find uh, so the, the, like the, the competition between plants can be a bit of an issue? Um, it can do. Um, some some definitely outcompete others, mm. um, and you know th that's just one of the ways that they evolve over time. And, and I've got an example later okay. on um, of something that became very overgrown. Um, so this is one that I'd probably put together maybe about two or three months before that picture was taken and it's you know it started developing nicely um it's lots of nice fresh growth nothing has overtaken the rest of it yet yeah. later in the year the ferns would probably be too big and they'd have to be cut back um, as i said there should be bluebells in the middle the bugle on the last slide would probably look good in there as well um the bu uh, bluebells i should mention again I, I find great difficulty using bulbs um, as flowering accents because um, I find it really hard to get them to flower in pots. Um, so those were pulled up from under my hedge basically and stuffed in the mm. pot <laughs> fairly um, j just before they started flowering. Um, when I've tried to keep these plantings alive for a couple of years, they stay alive, they come back the next spring, but they never flower. And, and I think that's to do with the, the volume of soil and, and the depth at which the bulbs are buried in the pots. You know, some things are very difficult to get to flower in small pots. Mm. We'll move on to the next one. That's another example. This is a cyclamen. Um, and this is a very small one. Um, less the, the pot is less than an inch tall. And cyclamen in general are very difficult because they've got huge bulbs. Um, most of us have probably tried doing something with the, the large ones you get from the garden centre and just trying to cram them into a pot and, you know, get them to flower and get them to produce mm. foliage is really difficult, um, I find. Um, this one was grown from a tiny seedling, um, but in general, there, there are species that I think look great, but I haven't had a lot of success. Well, um, I used to, when I was at university, one of my winter jobs, summer jobs and stuff, I was working in a, in a nursery and I... Uh, just before Christmas was working with cyclamen for yeah. 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, um, for two, three weeks at a time. So I never, ever want to see another one again. You must be sick of cyclamen. So, yeah, that's the, <laughs> one of the, okay. one of the, the banned species of, of excellent plants from my garden. Well, let's move on yeah. then. <laughs> but, no, no, I love it, but I just never want to see it. I'd never want it in my garden. Fair enough. Well, it's a good thing they're tricky yeah. then. Um, next slide, this is a little native primrose. Um, these I found a bit of a challenge because they're beautiful flowers. They look really good in mm. spring, um, but I find them quite fussy about growing conditions uh, because they seem to like quite a dry soil, quite a well-drained soil. And I found maintaining them in pots is, is fairly difficult, um, but it is rewarding. Um, the next one we've got... Um, same species in a different pot. That's really quite a shallow pot, um, though. It is. That, that's just a, um, a little ceramic slab, basically, yeah. um, with the um, soil that the primrose is growing in mounded up over yeah. the top of it, and some some moss on that. Um, getting, keeping it healthy, in that kind of pot is 
a real challenge because it stays too wet, essentially. I, I, I think it stays too wet for the primroses. Um, where I see them growing successfully in the wild, it's always on a sloping bank. Okay. It's always on something well-drained. So I find they don't really take very well to this, and you tend to get yellowing leaves, and the leaves tend to die off. Um, that may just be down to kind of poor technique, poor watering on my part, um, because kind of getting that right can be a little yeah. bit tricky, it, especially, as you say, you know, when you've got a lot of them, because then they just tend to all get blasted with the hose rather than being kind of watered individually. Yeah. Um, but they're really nice. Um, and moving on to the next one, um, this is just an example of that planting paired with a tree in a springtime display. Um, so it's it's one of the species that I, I find kind of really quite evocative. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a very good example of it. I mean, there's there's, there's no other real colour there, and so that really does sort of stand out very very well but it's not an overpowering color that, that kind of light lemony yellow is uh it's, it's just subtle enough to uh to, to work very well there uh can you just tell us a little bit about the trees i think there's a slide the tree it's a hawthorn yeah. um windswept hawthorn collected as a stick from an allotment in i don't know how long ago 15 17 years ago oh. something like that and it's it's kind of just starting to look good mm. now the you know as, as a windswept with kind of long uh nice long branches Th this photo i think was about two years ago possibly three yeah. years ago so it's gone a bit since then um and the picture was taken kind of just as it was coming into leaf in the spring which is why it's kind of paired with the primrose yeah. there you know it's kind of um the coming season basically so a lot of these have been flowers so far yeah. but obviously there are other species and other things you can use as well this is something a little bit different which is my most dangerous planting i call <laughs> it a stinging nettle um this was it was just it was growing next to my garage and i thought i'll put that in a yeah. pot and see if it works um and, and I, I quite like it no. i quite like the, the impression it's i mean like when i saw the first this picture for the first time i was like somebody's put a stinging nettle in a pot <laughs> i need to talk to this like, guy what the hell would anyone no no that? because it, that, that really is like the whole essence of kind of like doing like the accent plants and the kusamono and things like that it's like it's the it's a representation of the landscape around you and we are surrounded by stinging nettles exactly. and so it's perfect yeah so so the woods near me they're full of nettles you know little ferns bits of dead wood lying around and so on so, so again it's kind of take taking what's around you um and and kind of trying to use that creatively i guess um and the next few um are examples of that as well so if we move on to the next again, one this was just i mean this just blew my mind when i saw this this was just awesome can you just explain to us what how you did this right okay well what you've got there is a pine cone with a couple of seedling pine trees in it um, and also in the pot there's obviously some moss around it and there's some bits of lichen as well. Are, are those um, seedlings from that actual pine cone or did you plant them into it? What answer would you like? I want the, the real answer. <laughs> the real answer is they were planted in it with tweezers. Brilliant. Um, because when I've tried, well, you sometimes see people trying to grow stuff from from pine cones and it very rarely works because by the time you get a pine cone it's normally jettisoned its yeah. seeds so there normally aren't any seeds in it um so something like this it's obviously a temporary planting because you're not gonna kind of mm -hmm. maintain a couple of seedling pines in that um for for very How long old is that photo? Um, i think that photo is about oh, i don't know i think it was about three four years ago because we had a show at Wisley where we were uh, we were doing a kind of special exhibition on pines or something like that mm. so so here are some kind of seedling pines um, with a pine cone um, it I probably kept it for I don't know a few months something like that and then you know probably got bored with trying to maintain it and keep it up <laughs> yeah the, you know. the, I mean, that, that's one of the things though the um, it's a very short-term um, horticultural art form in some ways mm. because you can put something like this together in half an hour. Um, it you know takes no time at all, and therefore you know they're almost disposable. 
in some yeah. ways. So, I, so I've got some that I've had for years and years and years, but a lot of the others you'll be seeing kind of no longer mm. exist or no longer exist in that form or, or aren't in my garden anymore. Um, so this one, um, it was, you know, you collect the pine cone, you shove some of the soil that it's growing in, in the gaps between the the scales on the cone, um, you put in the seedlings, the tweezers, and uh, maybe stick some uh, keto around it um, as well. Um, water it carefully with a um, spray gun type thing. Um, and it looks good for a while. And again, it's kind of a nice mm. green spray image. Um, move on to the next one, maybe. Um, so this is another example, kind of inspired by the local woods. Um, and this was a bit of bark that I picked up with all this stuff growing on it already. So, you know, that's an instant accent, you know, pick it up, stick it in a pot, um, you know, maybe rearrange things a little yeah. bit. But what we've got is a piece of old um, bark off an old stump with lichen and mosses growing on it, um, put in a pot that I think it worked well. And what is that pot? Whole thing's about two inches tall. That's a pot that was made by Pinecone Ceramics based down on the south coast. Um, just really nice little accent. Tiny. Um, whole thing is about two inches tall. Yeah. So what we've got here is the tree that we've seen before, this time in what's supposed to be a kind of winter display. Um, and the accent here is just some moss um, on a piece of stone. Um, I, I find winter accents quite difficult because because everything's dead. Mm. Um, there's, there's not a lot of greenery around. So it's so a bit of moss on a flat stone, you know, looking like a bare winter hillside was the idea here. And then the next one is also kind of on a winter theme. Um, some grass um, resting for the winter um, or dead and it'll grow back in the spring but you know the idea here is you know it's seasonal it's um it's spent mm. um again it's the sort of thing that you see in the winter um yeah it's one of the things kind of like with the cockafoo um that's held in uh, early february uh, and so realistically like all of the accent plants should be dead or die, yeah. you know like yeah. very there should be very little kind of like liveliness to, to a lot of it uh and so you see all of these lo lovely luscious kind of like green um accents like the accent plant matching for most of the like the cockapoo trees is just absolutely appalling it's just kind of like mm -hmm. something that's that's green and yeah. and you know people are scared to, to kind of like to actually kind of do you know and have a um a, a dead looking uh, accent plant there whereas mm -hmm. you would sort of see that type of thing with like a a kado type display so somebody who's you know like yeah. doing it as a kind of like an artistic um much more of an artistic kind of pursuit so again you know representative of the the local woodlands um this has got a selection of tiny little woodland plants in it so there's there's an acorn in there there's a bit of dead wood um there's i think there's some heather some baby ferns again and so on and i put this together kind of the idea that it was a, an autumn type mm. scene sort of thing that you could pair with um, an autumn tree so if you if you move on to the next slide um we've got an example of that so so the idea there is it's something that would complement the kind of yellow leaves on the maple um without clashing too much so it's you know this is quite a small tree the the accent is very small so it doesn't kind of detract from it it's not big and it's not showy and i've used it again in the the slide after that um which is again this hawthorn tree that we talked mm -hmm. about before um, so this is just a little bit later on, maybe a month later, once the, the leaves have dropped, but you've still got the, the same things yeah. lying on the forest floor. That feels just a little bit small there for that tree. Mm. Uh, the, the maple, yeah. uh, you know, almost sort of perfect sort of sizing there. Uh, but yeah, you can just see that it's just a just a touch on the small side for the, yeah. For the hawthorn. Yeah, it's kind of fading away into the background just a yeah. little bit too much there. But, man, and this would be another woodland type accent um this is some some fungi again with a bit of wood and a bit of grass around it um i i, I personally think the fungi can be really interesting accents um because they you know they're interesting in themselves and they um definitely evoke a season um they're also very difficult because clearly those didn't grow in that pot 
Um, they were picked the night before the show <laughs> and stuck in that pot. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's almost like flower arranging in a sense. Uh, but I mean, there's a lot of that goes on in in yeah. bonsai and uh, the, the the display aspect. So there's nothing like massively wrong with it, to be honest. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I, I'm not feeling at all guilty. No, no. I, no, I <laughs> don't, don't think yeah. you should. I think a, a lot of people. Um, like for example, the um, Chinese quince that you see in in any mm. exhibition, the, the big trees with the big orange uh, yellow fruit on them. If not one single tree of those trees should have had those fruits growing on them yeah. specifically, because it's just it's just going to damage the tree, and you're not you're not going to get yeah. you're going to tie the tree out, and it's going to end up with real coarse branching. And so it's this just accepted practice that in order to get that image, you cheat. In yeah. inverted commas, because yeah. it's not really cheating; it's, it's doing the best thing for the tree. Uh, and, and with a lot of the accent plant creations, there's a lot of you know jiggery pokery that kind of goes on. And yeah. I, I don't see that doing that is terribly wrong. Well, I think that's that's the the artistic yeah. aspect of it. You know, it's again, it's, it's a bit like flower arranging in some ways, but it's about I don't know if you're doing a painting, you know. You wouldn't not use a brush because that was cheating or something. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a rubbish example, but it's you know it's part of the art of display, I guess. Um, but yeah, so you know, adding things to an existing planting. You know, I've, I've seen p people putting berries um, on accent plantings just to add a splash of colour, and it looks great. You know, and it works um, as long as it's something that's consistent with what would be there. And, and I think the next slide is another example of that. Again, th this is one of my favourites that uses fungi. So what we've got here is a mixed planting again. Um, we've got some heather in there. We've got some some of the native rushes and ferns and these three toadstools. Um, again, they didn't grow in there. They were put in there. Um, so that, that image only lasted a few days. Um, but it's kind of an image that I really like. We've got an example of how things change over time, because this is the same planting a year later. And obviously the, the mushrooms have gone, um, but and the, the heather's grown up, the ferns have grown up, and, and everything is kind of becoming a bit more bushy. It looks, it's got more presence. It's been in the pot for a longer time. Um, do I prefer it to the previous image? I don't know, um, but it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's quite nice in itself. It's a different image, you know, it's, it's something completely yeah. different, and that's... You know, it just shows the evolution and, and, and just how nature changes over time. Yeah. Uh, how approximately how big is that pot? That pot is probably um, if you put your two hands together, joining the fingers, um, it's it's about that size. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so maybe six, seven inches across, something <laughs> like that. that. Size. Yeah, that size. <laughs> Depends how big your hands are. That's how big it is. <laughs> yeah. What we've got here is some wetland plants um, with a bit of deadwood in the middle. So we've got some of these um, uh, joint leaf rushes. We've got some ferns. We've got some uh, marsh pennyworts, I think those are. Um, that was one that I quite liked. Um, but again, you know, you were talking earlier on about some plants outcompeting mm. others. We talked about things changing over time. Um, so if you move on to the next image, um, you can see a couple of years later, it's kind of overgrown beyond salvation. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, you know, w when it gets to this point, it's time to break it down well, and use the pot for something just, else. Uh, you know, reduce the numbers of, of one of the, like the, the, the strongest one there and, and things come back or? <laughs> You, you you can do, but um, I think there are a couple of things going on there. One is that the this plant in particular, the roots just absolutely fill the pot. Yeah. So it's very difficult to just kind of prune it back and keep everything neat and tidy in its place. Um, and then some of the other elements on it, they in it they suffer. So in, in this one here, you, you can't see any trace of the ferns. The ferns have kind of lost vigor. Um, the the rushes have lost vigor this has essentially become a weed uh, and overgrown everything um, and obviously the pot gets reused um, and this is an example of a um, spring display again so again we've got these yellow springtime flowers i think this photo was probably taken around about late march something like that um and you know it's similar in some respects to the previous composition because it's got these tall reeds in it it's quite 
got a bit of dead wood and some ferns in the middle and so on. Uh, but none of that invades a penny word that would take things mm. over. So this is one that I'm hoping to maintain for a couple of years as well. And if you move on to the next one, um, this shows how a planting can change in just a couple of weeks. Um, so here you see the same composition two weeks later. Um, the yellow flowers have all vanished and that foliage there will eventually die back. The ferns have come on a little bit, um, but the kind of big addition is the the bugles here growing up at the back, which again, they're a lovely later spring mm. native plant. And the, the kind of, for me, the, the change in the color scheme, the change in the density between those two images is, is, is quite striking. And I prefer the second one, to be honest. Yeah. Right, uh, so what's this one? Right, okay, so what we've got here is an epimedium. Um, I think it's flowers of sulfur is the cultivar. Mm. And this is a, I, I think is a beautiful plant. Um, and it's, it's one that well, this one was um, displayed on a show. It was at a club style show. Um, it was actually in a different pot to that. Um, but it's, I, I think there are some differences between shows where you are putting on individual displays of um, trees paired with accent plants and the traditional British club style show where you have basically rows of trees from a club um, on the bench, mm. um, which looks a little bit like your bonsai benches at home. And I think the, the larger kusamono plantings can actually work reasonably well in that club type setting um, or club display type setting um, because you're, you're not pairing them with um, a specific tree, trying to create a specific image. Yeah. They're kind of a, an eye catching thing, something that divides up the display yeah. a little bit. Um, so. Yeah, something like that. Well, an amusing bush. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, sorry. No, no, you can no. edit that. No, no, no. That's, that's staying in. Don't worry about that. Yeah. yeah. So, so this this one was actually used um, in a display of that type, but it's clearly much too tall to use as an individual mm. accent. It's probably about a foot tall, wow. I would guess. You know. Um, and maybe slightly smaller than that. And, and the same is true of some other kind of really attractive species uh, and really kind of attractive plants you might want to use. So if we move on to the next one, um, we've got quaking grass. I, I think this is a lovely plant, yeah. you know, I particularly like the images. But if you move on to the next slide, you'll see that it's clearly very big um, and too big to be used mm. as an accent planting. Um, although if you move on to the next slide, um, it's something nice to have on the bench. Probably about a foot tall, yeah. something like that, maybe slightly over that. Um, and, you know, similarly, other types of decorative grasses, like the next slide. This is bunny grass. Um, and again, this, this, this is a smaller planting, but uh, this one is probably about 10 inches tall, something like that. And again, it's something that looks really nice, nice thing to have on your bench, but it's not going to be um, something you'd use on a, as an accent. Mm. And, and the same is true of many. Uh, moving on to the next one, we've got a mixed planting here that's got some blood grass in it um, and some bamboo as well as ferns. Um, so this one would be about a foot tall. The blood grass is nice, but again, you know, it's one of those species like the quaking grass that is really attractive, looks good on the bench, but it's too big to use as an accent. Although if you move on to the next slide, um, I think it can look good on its own, um, just just displayed yeah. on a formal and, setting. Uh, this, this one here reminds me of uh, Ikebana a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you, I did, we didn't sort of uh, mention it, but you were talking about like learning about the like the composition of like um, of, of the, the the kusumono with you know, having the tall thing and something at the bottom and in yeah. the middle and things like that. Um, those ideas are very similar to, to a lot of uh, ikebana. I mean, where did you actually kind of uh, study that? Where did you pick the, those ideas up from? Um, I think studying it is probably. Kind of a, a where did that idea come to you from? Yeah. Because it's um, it's true, but I think I've, I've, I'm not sure where I picked it up. To be honest, I mean there are a couple of quite good books that I've read um, that have provided information. I think mm. on 
it helped me understand what what I was seeing and doing um, rather than being an instruction manual. So there's a book by Willie Benz uh, called Bonsai Kusamuna Suizeki that's got some nice information on it. Um, and Kyozo Murata's Four Seasons of Bonsai has some absolutely stunning accent plantings in there. Um, so really just kind of picking things up from that um, and reading around generally. So I don't think I've, you know, I've never kind of studied mm. um, or had a source to study, um, you know, this is what it should look like, essentially. So, oh, so you've got some, uh, some images of hostas. Yeah, I know hostas are something that clearly they're a plant that's really popular because they're absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, a lot of people grow hostas primarily for their foliage. Um, I like them for the flowers. Yeah. So they're really rewarding for about two weeks of the year and then the rest of the time they're just this horrible nightmare keeping the slugs off. Yeah. <laughs> one. Um, this is something that's too tall, I think, to be used as an accent plant and also a bit too attention grabbing, yeah. I would say, to be used as an accent plant. Um, but as something displayed on its own or on the bench, I think they're lovely. Um, the next one um, is one of my favorite hostas. Um, this is a variety called Blue Mouse Ear. Um, and this one doesn't have a pot. Um, it's just um, the root ball is in there with some moss wrapped around it at the moment um, in this picture. How long have you, on a, how long have you had it like that? Um, it's been like that, I think, for maybe four years, wow. something like that. And they, um, it was in a pot for a number of years before that. And eventually I thought, I don't like this pot very yeah. much. It was a kind of horrible blue hexagonal pot that really didn't suit it. So I just took it out of the well, pot. Have you found that uh, the, like the leaf size, uh, the flower size, and the, just the general growth has become a little bit more compact since you've had it out of the pot? Um, it's kind of limited space or... Not really. I mean, the I, I actually haven't seen it change or do much except mature a little bit over the years. Mm. So if you, if you move on to the next picture, that this, this one was taken earlier this year, um, you got a better view yeah. of the roots there. Um, the planting's a little bit bigger, a little bit more mature, but hasn't changed that much apart from increasing the density and it's that's pretty much what the the variety is like in terms of size um, as far as i'm aware um the next slide shows how it lives most of the year round um, just sits on that tile on the bench and the roots are exposed and it doesn't seem to mind it at all it doesn't seem to care that it doesn't have a pot all i can say is you, you're just very very good at watering <laughs> Well, this is one that is quite hard to get wrong because you just blast it with water yeah. and it doesn't care. And again, being on something flat and shallow, um, you get um, a, a layer of water underneath it there. Yeah. So it, it stays a lot wetter than you would imagine. Um, and we, you know, when the outside of the root mass dries, then clearly that stops the roots expanding too much and stops it growing. So mm -hmm. it, I guess it kind of repots itself. Um, but yeah, so it's not everything needs to be in a pot. Um, if you flick on to the next one, um, one thing I quite like is putting things on stones and pieces of wood. Uh, and this one is, uh, again, native rush um, just sitting on a piece of sandstone there with, with a natural hollow in it. Yeah. Um, and similar thing going on with the next image, which is mossy saxifrage on a... A um, piece of flat limestone there. Uh, um, I quite like and that, that one. limestone that was, well. is completely natural? You, you found it that yeah. way? Yeah, found it that way. Um, natural hollow in it. Um, and then if you move on to the next one, you you know, in hills around here, you pick up bits of flint yeah. with holes going through them. Um, so this one now has something growing on it. Um, and the next slide is, again, a very similar planting. Um, there's a hole going right through there and the roots of the, the plants go through as well. That's a house leek. It's, um, oh God, what's the Latin there again? It's a, I've completely gone blank. Um, it's, a, it's a succulent. It's what they call uh, chicken and hens in the States. Um, it's called a house leek over here. Simple Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah, thank you. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm terrible okay. at, at the, the plant names for accents. Absolutely terrible. And uh, Well, you, you got that one. You've nailed boom. it. <laughs> Probably the only one I could get. <laughs> well, the next one. 
that's a test for you what's in that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad connection going on here yeah uh, so again i mean this is just some stuff some weeds uh, literally put on a piece of curved sandstone rock um with some soil um and a layer of keto around it to hold it in place and then some moss pressed into that so again we've got the ivy leaf toad flax the herb robert and some ferns and so on the sort of thing that you'd find growing in a corner of your garden or growing in the local woods um and you can use bits of wood as well um the next yeah. two or three um are pieces of wood so so the next one here um again we've got some seedling uh pines Again, these didn't grow here. Um, they've just been planted on top of this uh, piece of dead wood. Uh, I think it's quite a nice effect. Yeah, Next one is a little bit more showy. Um, this is Herb Robert again. Um, that's so. plant it grows all over my garden. It's just... Yeah, and it's, it's great. Yeah. You know, it's, it's you, you can reduce it in size. Yeah. It's really versatile. You're never going to run out of it. <laughs> um, is the even the leaf colors change yeah. you know you've got green leaves you've got uh, red leaves um when it's flowering um it's got these beautiful lilac flowers uh, mm -hmm. and even after those have gone you've got the interesting seed heads so, so i think that's a really useful plant it does grow very big but you can keep it small uh, by pruning it back and so on um and growing in a constricted space so it's uh, it's a really really useful plant and it's one that most of us have got and you'll find it in the next one as well um which is again planted on a piece of wood this is one i've had for quite a few years now um and it's uh, just a piece of bark that i found one day with some stuff growing on it it's got lichens and mosses naturally occurring on it and then i've added ferns herb robert grasses um and various other things um to the top of it um, just by boring a hole in it and sticking the root of the plant in uh, and it lives quite nicely and that's gone through kind of quite a bit of evolution over the years um, and is still alive today in, in one form or another. Right so you mentioned about uh, some less successful uh, examples of, of actual yeah. plants. Do you want to just wanna... Okay so the first one here in the white pot or cream colored pot the, i think i've included these just as an example of the fact that not everything works um and there are lots of things wrong with it and i said earlier on that sometimes you you don't realize why things don't work until you know a little bit more about what does work yeah. i think um if that makes any sense at all so this is an attempt to um, get some bluebells in a pot because I like bluebells, essentially. Um, and these, I think, probably came from under my hedge at some point um, and were just plunked in a pot. And there are all kinds of things that are wrong with this. Um, for one thing, they look as though they've just been plunked in a pot. Mm. You know, there's no feeling of age. There's no feeling of maturity there. Um, the foliage is very, very sparse. Um, we've got one... Um, head of bluebells there that um, really isn't particularly impressive and it's you know it looks quite skinny there's none of the the kind of middle interest um, that I was talking about earlier on the moss is the wrong sort um, it's kind of long fiber moss rather than something that's a kind of a little bit more attractive the pot is you know very wrong <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. much more kind of formal Whereas, um, not, not, not quite formal, but um, polished, smooth. I think Cusimona work much better in more rustic um, or more interesting pots, things that are kind of more humble. <laughs> but then, you know, we've got another example in, in the next slide, which is, again, the pot's the wrong shape, the pot's the wrong dimensions, the wrong colour. Again, a rustic pot would work much better here. And the plant here is much too small. You know, the pot just totally overwhelms it. Um, and it's kind of very thin, very boring, and so on. This, we've got a rectangular pot, and this is actually quite a nice pot, although you can't see it very well, um, but it's entirely wrong for that planting. Um, I don't think that uh, square or rectangular pots work very well with Kusumono because they're um, th they don't look natural. Um, they don't complement the the shapes of the plants. I don't think. And this particular example, the the planting is very immature, um, 
And later on, a couple of years later, it did look a bit better, but the pot was still the wrong mm. shape. You know, you've got these, all these organic shapes, and then you've got this kind of hard-edged um, pot there. So, so it really doesn't work, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when it does work, though, it, it works very, very well. Uh, but it is a very difficult mm -hmm. one to match. I I'll, I'll definitely will give you that one. Next um, one. Right. Okay, so the last one um, is a much more suitable pot, I think. Mm. Um, you can much more complementary to the style of planting, but what's wrong with this one is just the colour. Well, the colour scheme is the main thing that's wrong with it. So we've got a real colour clash going on between the three flowers in there. They're, they're not kind of tied together in any way, uh, and there's also probably not enough foliage there um, to kind of uh, really fill it out. So it's it's quite an immature planting, and the the combination of plants that's there i think doesn't work yeah. in themselves each of those is a nice plant and each of those would work quite well in a different accent but when you put the three of them together i don't think they complement each other at all the the colors essentially clash um what appeals much more to me is if we move on to the final one the last slide things that look as, as natural as possible so we're back to my kind of bit of wood again um and what I'm really drawn to are the kind of things that I see in the, the countryside around me. And that's what I'd kind of really be striving to do, I think. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, that's a beautiful composition. And, and that's, uh, how old is that one? That one I've had for about five or six years, I think, in, in, in various forms. So it's kind of changed a lot over time. Um, you know, different plants in it. There are different plants in it now. It's got, um, this year, it's got a couple of wild rose cuttings that have been stuck into it, and they seem to have taken. So, you know, it might look nice next year. Okay. Just have to wait and see. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit like uh, Trigger's Broom from uh, Only Fools exactly. and Horses. <laughs> it's exactly. constantly changing. But uh, but no, no, it's, uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, well, you've been... Uh, We've been going on for, for, for an hour now, um, and I'm gonna have to try and edit this down to. Uh, to, to <laughs> no, no, no! It's been it's been eye, eye opening for me, and this is kind of like what I said at the start. Um, it's just refreshing to see people kind of going out and collecting things, you know, even from the driveway, and, and just representing mm. some of the more humble kind of plants, um, and moving away from kind of like a lot of the uh weird wonderful varieties of plants that you can get because one of the things that mm -hmm. i mean go back to, to the hostas and things like that you see people obsessing you know quite obsessed with hostas um but they don't really work very well as a as an accent plant but then you get people mm -hmm. trying to collect them all you know all the, all the different varieties of them uh and then just completely overlooking some of the the, the really interesting sort of native um plants that we have around uh so it's great to see them um, being made um, from the stuff that, that you find around them. So, um, really appreciate you, you 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 talking to us today, and oh, um, you. for sharing your, 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 your phenomenal kind of um, creations. And it would be great to see you just you know doing some more and 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 seeing them in exhibitions going forward. Um, it'll be great to see some 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 of the larger kind of um, uh, kusamono type creations where you really kind of go into the you know having the, the the foliage the middle sections the you know all of the things that you were talking about there because um clearly you got an eye for it and thank you very much tom okay my pleasure uh, thank you for no, having no, me. No. uh it's been a pleasure and uh yeah I'll speak to you soon okay so uh thank you very much to tom as i said there uh for, for doing that um and thanks to everyone for for sitting through uh and watching that now a lot of those ideas and concepts that Tom were talking about, touched on. You know, I touched on some of them uh, to begin with. But one of the few things, one of the things that I really have taken from his work and from, from looking at the things, is the use of like the native material. And we talked a little bit about like kind of the idea of collecting things and picking things up and things like that. Uh, it should be said that it's very, you know, there's some legal grey areas with that. Um, so don't just go out digging in the wild and just picking up whatever plants you want um, because that's not a good thing to do. It's the same as with, with collecting trees. It should only be done in environments where you have permission and where you are not going to destroy the, the you know, like the, the local um, uh, landscape and, and the, the, 
ecosystem that's around. Uh, and so looking at um, growing from seed, growing from cuttings and, and, and things like that, a uh, much kind of like better way um, uh, going rather than just trying to dig up all sorts of stuff from, from everywhere. That said, a lot of the, the things that, um, uh, that Tom were working, was working with and one of the reasons it really sort of caught my eye was the use of what we would talk about as, you know, invasive weeds and things like that. Um, uh, the herb robber, the steam nettles and things like that and actually sort of taking those things that we would consider to be um, you know weeds and a problem uh, and that grow everywhere and taking them out of that kind of like normal situation and putting them into pots, putting them on like a pedestal for, for appreciation um, is something which kind of like the, the, the kusumono, the, the, the accent plant type um, mentality should really have um, I think and so that's one of the reasons why I was very much attracted to, to, to sort of Tom's work and I'm really grateful for him to, uh, for sharing it um, other than that uh, I think the one of the things to, to sort of take from, um, from from Tom's discussion there and uh, from his experience and from, from everyone else is, is this idea of the evolution over time I mentioned about it with the, the idea of mochikomi and that applies to certain types of plantings and certain um, uh, grasses and you know, th things like that like I you know, pointed out the, the Harkoni grass uh, you know if that was a mixed planting with other things then obviously you've got these, these levels of competition that can that can go on uh, within um, within there and things will change over time and quite often what you'll find when you have those mixed plantings is that you do have to kind of like actively hold certain things back in trying to encourage others uh, but it's one of those things that you're only going to kind of um I can, it's, it's not something that could be taught it's you're just going to get that sort of experience and so it's really um a very interesting way to kind of get to know a lot of these plants and to and to uh to, to go down that rabbit hole is just to just to try and find those things put them together find things that work well together and realistically what you're looking to try and do is going back to the to, to you know what I was talking about in terms of the locations and things like trying to get things that would normally and naturally kind of grow together so not taking you know alpine plants and bog plants and trying to put those together because obviously you know the the conditions that they require are very different so yeah. basic common sense sort of thing like that. so um that's pretty much I think all that can be sort of said I said at the start I mean the, the idea of, of accent plants really isn't tremendously difficult um the actual execution of it is insanely difficult. Putting it all together in an artistic way is very, very difficult. Uh, and it's something that I'm, as I said, you know, not particularly capable of doing. Uh, a lot of that is because of you know, lifestyle and such like that. But um, yeah, I, hats off to, to those people that can do it and, uh, and can do it well. So hopefully that's been um, a sort of uh, you know, good inspiration to everybody to, to go out and start making some uh, some, some interesting accent plant uh, and kusumono type um, arrangements and to, just to enjoy having them like on the bench you know one of the things that Tom mentioned was you know, just having them on the bench they don't have to get used in an exhibition but it's just having those little bits of nature those little seasonal changes that you'll be able to notice and just having them dotted around on the bench is just adds that extra layer of, uh, of interest to, to, to bonsai as a hobby. Uh, a few people in the chat had mentioned about kind of like do you have to use accent plants and about uh, you know other objects and, and tenpai and things like that, and just using bonsai, you know maybe just displaying it by itself. There's no hard and fast rules about kind of like how you display bonsai as long as it's done kind of like artistically and you know with sympathy to the tree and you know it, just with thought and care and consideration. Uh, obviously, in conventional bonsai exhibitions that have a set kind of pattern and people are expecting to see things and it's going to be judged into certain criteria then you have to live um, you, you, by those conventions you have to kind of like play by those conventions there's, there's, you know there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that but there's no reason why you can't kind of like just display in your own home uh, and such like and so uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, with a picture of uh, a display that I created recently. Uh, this was done uh, for Bonsai Esprit, uh, the French magazine, fantastic magazine. Uh, sadly, they stopped doing their English language version. Uh, but Michel, the editor of Esprit, approached me and said, could you put on a COVID lockdown related bonsai display? Um, and 
I thought about it for a while and it kind of went to the back of my mind and then the deadline came and she's like oh can you do something so I, I you know I thought okay well what's my life been like over the last couple of months uh, and just kind of like how can I kind of create a sort of a bonsai display that, that, that sort of reflects that and so um, this is what I came up with uh, and so bonsai doesn't have to be in a uh, sports hall it doesn't have to be in a, you know a formal exhibition for you to enjoy you can just bring it inside put it on display uh, you can put a uh, a peter rabbit tenpai accent plant uh, if you want to you can have your you know whatever accent plants you want around just to kind of like create some scenes create some enjoyment and and just to, to kind of like uh, you know, bring bonsai, to, uh, you know, you and bonsai close together, you and nature close together. Um, the accent plants and kusumono are a very easy kind of entry level way of doing it, but they're also a very kind of like a deep and meaningful aspect to it. So I hope that's kind of uh, been of some interest to you all and of, of great use. Uh, and it has been admit to me, I'm going to try again to, to, to try and make some more Kusumoto this year. Once again, I bought loads of stuff for, for doing it this year, but they're just still sat out in their plastic pots, uh, ready to be put together. Uh, so, such is life. It's on the list of things to do. Uh, but other than that, I'll just, I'll just you know, turn to Tom uh, and just look at his pictures instead. Uh, so, uh, this stream, um, I don't know when the next one will be. Uh, I'll try and do one. Uh, next week or the week after or something it's just lockdown life all that rest the rest of it uh but uh it'll all be out there on social media and emails and, uh, and stuff like that uh, so the only thing to say is this stream was uh brought to you in association with honeydew which i uh enjoyed uh, whilst watching that video uh so thank you very much tom thanks to everyone for for, for tuning in and watching uh, if you found it really useful uh, and all that, you can uh, consider donating and stuff like that if you want. Um, where is it? There we go. No. Uh, other than that, I shall see you when I see you next. Oh, no. Put, put it up twice. There we go. Um, yeah. Enjoy uh, 